Sometimes when I start a project, I like to design everything on paper first. And by paper, of course, I mean the computer. But sometimes I like to take more of a shoot from the hip approach. This approach is way more fun, but it's not without its drawbacks. You sometimes have to redo some things. I got a little bit ahead of myself on the front suspension on this car, and by that I mean I bought a bunch of stuff and then made major design changes. So I had to redo a few things. But as I always say, why do something once when you can do it four times? I like to solve problems, so much so that I often create problems just to solve them. I've been doing that with a front suspension on this car pretty much since I started this project. But this time, I've got a big one. This is a Mustang 2 front end, and by that I mean it has very little to do with anything Ford ever put on a Mustang 2 except for the basic geometry. It's all aftermarket stuff, and most of it isn't even compatible with other generic Mustang 2 parts. That's how big and complicated this aftermarket Mustang 2 world is. So I decided to do something really weird here. If you follow my projects, this will not surprise you. I went with all this Mustang 2 suspension nonsense thinking I would stick with the steel wheels, but I kind of like the way the Tesla Aero wheels look. But these don't fit the Mustang 2 hubs. They have the same bolt pattern, but the center bore on the Tesla wheels is much too small to fit over the fat nose of the Willwood hub. But I can do it the other way around. The Steelys will work on the Tesla hub, so I figured why not make custom uprights that use the Tesla hub based on the existing Mustang 2 geometry. So I'm going to have a 1950 Jaguar connected to aftermarket suspension arms that are based loosely on a 45-year-old Ford design. Those will be connected to a custom upright that holds a modern Tesla hub that will have the shiny Willwood brakes. Super simple. I'm replacing a spindle with an upright. So what's the difference between a spindle and an upright? Well, a spindle looks like this. It has bearings that go on this part that sticks out, and the hub spins around those bearings. Usually these are tapered bearings, and when you preload them by tightening down a little nut here ever so slightly, it squishes them together. This was the preferred way to attach a spinning wheel to something since basically the invention of the wheel. Here's a quick story about early mechanical engineering. In the long, long ago, spindles were just straight rods sticking out of a buggy or a train or something. Sometimes they would break, and they would always break in the same spot, right at the attachment. It would break here because this sharp edge makes the stress go way up. So if you just make this sharp edge less sharp, say with like a radius, the stress goes way down. So much so that you can just make the entire spindle smaller and it's still stronger. Anyway, after centuries of use, the spindle has recently given way to an upright with a hub attached to it. The hub has the bearings and the upright just sort of attaches the hub to the suspension and the steering. The spindle is called a spindle because the wheel spins around this part that sticks out, and an upright is called an upright because they are tall and upright. I just made that last part up, but it sounds true. So here's my basic design. I need to have these two parts that bolt to the ball joints. They will be in the same location as the spindle ball joint mounts. I also need the part that bolts to the hub. This will put the wheel in the same spot as the spindle. Except one thing, it's pretty common on this suspension setup to use a 2 inch drop on the spindles. It helps get the car lower. I didn't have the 2 inch drop on my spindles, but I'm going to add it to the upright so I can get the front of the car a bit lower. The third part of this upright is all this sheet metal that connects the ball joint parts to the hub parts and makes it all one piece. This will be made out of welded 1 8 inch steel sheet metal. The spindle is made of just straight pieces of steel connecting the parts together, but this is super inefficient. With this box design, you get a more direct load path, and it's going to be way stiffer. You can see I have a little gap here. We'll fix that later by just bending the metal and welding it in. This makes a complete upright, except the part that I need to actually steer the car. I made this a removable piece so I can change it if it turns out to totally screw up my steering geometry. I also built it with some adjustability for my steering ratio. The last part is just the caliper mount. I'm also going to have this laser cut. This will bolt on, and I did that so that I could change the brakes in the future if I want to. I could go with all Tesla brakes, caliper, and rotor just by changing this one piece. I don't think I'm going to do that, but the option is there. So as I said before, there are three main parts to this upright. The part that connects the ball joints, the part that connects to the hub, and the sheet metal that connects it all together. So now I need all of those pieces. How to make them? Well, the parts that connect to the ball joints are somewhat easy. The ball joints are tapered, so I do have to drill a 7 degree tapered hole. If I was at the beginning of this project, I would probably use different ball joints that didn't have a taper, but I already have the suspension arms, and it would be nice to keep this all backwards compatible in the case that it turns out that I have no idea what I'm doing. 
Anyway, to drill the taper, I roughed out this hole using my lathe and finished it up with a tapered reamer. The part that bolts to the hub is a little more complex. I need a profile cutout, four tapped holes, three drilled holes, and one big ass hole in the middle that needs to be pretty accurate. This looks like a part for a CNC mill, but no, that's expensive. Here's what I did. I got this part laser cut, but I had all the holes undersized slightly. Then I used my crappy mill to drill out the holes and tap them. For the center, I just chucked it up in my lathe and cut it to size. The sheet metal parts that hold it all together, I made those out of 8th inch steel, and I also had those laser cut. I got all this laser done by sendcutsend.com. A friend told me about these guys. Awesome place to get small batch laser cutting. They were way cheaper than anything else I found, and the quality was good. I added tabs and slots in all these pieces. This makes it sort of self-locate with the help of some rubber bands. If you're ever designing something like this for a fabricator to weld up, design it with these tabs. It will reduce the chance of errors and it will make the fabricators not hate your project. And trust me, you do not want your fabricators to hate your project. I also needed some tubes cut out to fill in these spots so I can get a nut and socket in there. I just chopped these off of some tube. I flattened the part in CAD, printed it out, cut it, and traced it under the tube. Once I had all these pieces, I just had to weld them together. I started welding the tube pieces so I could get weld on the side that you can't get to once it's assembled. Then I just rubber banded everything else and went to town. Partway through welding these, I realized I was just starting to run low on shielding gas. Should be up here, but it's down here. Not good. Anyway, I decided to just finish up one of these all the way instead of running out of gas 80% of the way through both of them. This gives me the added bonus of seeing if I messed anything up on one before I do the same thing on the second. That's what I'm telling myself, but to be honest, I've done so much welding on this that if there's something wrong with it, it's probably going in the trash. So once I have it all welded, I need to paint the inside to keep it from rusting, but I'm not going to be able to get all these nooks and crannies with spray paint or a brush. So I'm just going to pour paint in and swish it around. In fact, I'm going to use some pour 15. Where is my pour 15? There's some paint, uh, brake fluid, alcohol, blinker fluid. Ah, here it is. This stuff is great. It's kind of a heavy duty rust preventative coating. I'll just open this can. Just, just open it. Maybe if I try over here. Damn, maybe this one's bad. That's okay, I have another one. We'll just open this one. Good thing I bought a six pack. All right, so I'm just gonna pour it in here and swish it around to coat the whole inside. You don't have to pour it in, even though it's called pour 15. In fact, it specifically says that you're supposed to do multiple thin layers. So if you're a direction follower, then you're probably watching the wrong video. You do wanna wear gloves though. This stuff is not just paint. It's not removable with acetone or anything like that. So you definitely wanna wipe off anything that you don't want to be permanently black. I probably should have stirred this earlier, right? Probably, let's do that. As for the outside, I'm just gonna spray paint that. We'll use a semi-gloss black because it hides imperfections. So nobody will look at this and say, who the f welded this? Well, it turns out the paint didn't hide my welds. In fact, I think it looks worse. Whatever, nobody will ever see it. To attach the steering arm part of this monstrosity, I will need to have a nut on the inside, but I won't be able to get to it with a hub installed. So I'm gonna use one of these press fit nuts. You just sort of press these into sheet metal and they mostly stay in place, mostly. You're supposed to press them in with an arbor press or something like that, but I can't do that with it assembled. So I'm gonna use this uh, C-clamp, which maybe if I kind of, and I turn it this way and if I try, you know what, I'm just gonna tighten a bolt down on the other side really tight. There we go. So then we'll just assemble it. But first I have to take this bolt back out so I can get the steering arm on there. Then we just assemble it. But first we have to drill this hole that I forgot to drill out. And then we just assemble it. Except that I also forgot to drill out this hole. I always undersize my laser or water jet holes so I can drill them out to get the exact size, but then I always forget that I undersize them. Anyway, then we just assemble it. 
It's an upright and a hub. It's also pretty heavy, but that's fine. This will help me even out my terrible weight balance. Oh, speaking of, we have a winner for the crack lighter for the closest guess for the weight balance. The correct answer was 61.54 front and 38.45 rear. Total weight came in at just under 2,400 pounds, which was less than I was expecting. The closest answer was 62.38, and the first to guess that was David Younggren. So I'll be sending David this crack lighter commemorating the time he guessed the weight balance correctly. Note that this is a crack lighter and not a meth lighter, so you cannot use it for meth. I had this caliper adapter laser cut out of 5 8 inch steel. I did that because it was the same thickness that I was using for the part of the upright that the hub bolts to. But it's way too thick for this. I could have easily gone with half the thickness. It'll be fine this way, but I might actually remake these. They just look kind of lazy. So with the caliper in the right place, I need to get the disc in the right place. To do that, I need a hat. One of these hats. Using the CAD model, I determined the offset I needed, and then I just went to Willwood's website and found the hat closest to that offset. It's off by a few thousandths of an inch, so I'll have to shim the caliper mount to get the caliper centered on the rotor. Actually, I'll probably just mill down the adapter that I made. Two modifications are needed for this hat. One is the stud holes. It's made for half inch studs, but Tesla uses 14 millimeters, which is a bit bigger. The base of the stud is actually 15.25 millimeters, weirdly. Tesla's rotors have these oversized quite a bit, so I'm just gonna drill it out to 5 eighths of an inch. These can be a bit bigger because the rotor doesn't center itself on the studs. It centers itself on the center of the hub. The inside diameter of these hats is three inches, but the hub center landing is 70 millimeters, which is smaller than three inches. 70 millimeters is just barely under two and three quarters of an inch. So what I'm gonna do is buy some aluminum tube that has a three inch outside diameter and a two and three quarter inch inside diameter. Then I'm just gonna carefully cut off a piece that's slightly thinner than the hat thickness, and I'm gonna hammer it onto the Tesla hub. This will give me a concentric landing that is exactly the right size to center these hats. After that, I install the disc on the hat, install the hat on the hub, and then install the caliper onto the upright. And that's it. I have a custom, unnecessarily complex upright so that I can use Willwood calipers and rotors originally intended for a Ford Mustang II suspension on my Tesla Model 3 hubs attached to my 1950 Jaguar Mark V. Because I like to keep things simple. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm.